pleased to be back to wider and, and make a presentation which uh, links up to the kind of issues that um, wider is usually involved with. This is um, a work which is nearing completion and we would like to thank the uh, project grantees which is the South Asia Network on Development and Environmental Economics which gave us the funding to do this kind of work. This is of course part of a five country project that we are looking at and trying to link up with the variability uh, and migration via the agricultural uh, route. So, so the question that we are asking is um, how, how do we really try to analyze this and this is the method that we are, I'm going to use, that we are going to look at the context and the objectives of the study, then how the migration patterns are in the Indian context, and that in some sense sets the stage for how we are modeling and how we are looking at the uh, analysis, and then of course the methodology and the final results. Um, so if we, if we really look at the linkage between climate change and agriculture, there has been substantial amount of evidence to show that the two are linked, um, in the sense there are adverse effects, and if you see the first graph out there, uh, which is basically trying to link up the um, case of the South Asia, where you can see that without climate change, the blue part is basically showing increases in per capita calorie availability. And the two scenarios are for 2050, and we start with 2000, and you see that the 2050 uh, availability is lower in the presence of climate change scenarios, two different scenarios depending on the cases. If you look at the um, focus on just the two Indian examples. They are, they are done by my co-author uh, for this particular paper as well, who's done substantial work for India. And you do see that the proportion of people in the bottom um, two expenditure classes in the rural areas, that's the bottom poor, is actually increasing depending on the intensity of the climate change. These three are different scenarios for climate change, and this gives the most intensive scenario of climate change over the period of time. And you see the effect R is more severe in the rural than in the case of the urban population. Um, there is also some interesting study that was subsequently done in 2011, about last year, where uh, there was scope for adaptation that was basically trying to bring it through the modeling of spatial autocorrelation, which shows that that without spatial autocorrelation, the, there is a higher decline in the net revenue from agriculture as a percentage of the 1990 base value uh, when you allow for adaptation. So this kind of brings us to two uh, interesting linkages that there is an impact of uh, climate change on agriculture and that some of the impact does have a, a lesser effect when we give scope for adaptation. And in this uh, sort of uh, literature is where the migration comes in. And so the, there are several reasons why migration can happen. One of them is this most standard uh, literature that we know of coming from the Lewis model or the harris todaro model, which is basically that the process of migration, uh, the process of urbanization brings with it a certain amount of migration. But what is also important to note is that the pace of migration is somewhat lower for the kind of growth rates that these regions are showing. So, so people are not moving as much as they should for the kind of overall economic growth that they are showing. But they also see that there are a lot more um, shocks that can happen in these regions through cyclones, droughts and floods, which are also uh, exacerbated by the climate change events and migration can happen. Some of it can be short term, some, some of it can be long term. There is also a short term migration that's increasingly being recognized, particularly in the Indian context, due to the distress in agriculture and rural livelihoods because of the, uh, the kind of investments that are taking place or the, or the uh, lesser productivity that agriculture is bringing in. Um, if we focus more on climate change and migration, then there is substantial amount of uh, literature that has been coming in since mid-2000, looking into the uh, migration as an adaptation strategy to climate change, in the sense that uh, people want to move out of the kind of distress that they have, and, and that becomes as a kind of adaptation strategy. And if you look at the particular work that came out in 2011 by Black et al., uh, it largely synthesizes this kind of work into different uh, subheads of uh, migration due to environmental conditions, migration due to social, economic and demographic reasons and sort of puts uh, the climate stress as one of those environmental reasons. Um, and if you look at the, the kind of the way the studies have been looking at it, uh, we can say that migration could either be a cross-country movement like from Mexico to the US or from <clears throat> 
uh, the Asian countries to like the Philippines to the uh, other nations as well as within country migration. So the migration is uh, discussed in, in the sense from both perspectives and the migration can also can be either planned which means uh, there is a very clear uh, framework which says that there is inundation going to take place and there can be a planned migration or there can be an autonomous migration where people just migrate uh, in an in a immediate response to a distress or a shock. Um, and coming to the uh, more focused issue of this particular topic that we have here, uh, the, the, I think the tone uh, was set in by the paper in, in 2010 by Feng et al, which was looking at the link between uh, the, uh, the impact of climate change through, the, uh, through its effect on maize and wheat yields and the emigration from Mexico to the US. And they sort of used a certain methodology, which to some extent we are also going to follow. And we find that there was, in their study, that there is some amount of a weak connection between these three uh, linkages. Uh, then they subsequently came up with a more recent work early this year, uh, linking it up to the US case, where they then talk about internal migration within the US on the impact of climate change uh, productivity in, in certain parts of the US and its impact on internal migration. Then uh, again, you see another recent work that basically looks at the uh, sub-Saharan region. And in fact, it, it very nicely splits up the migration into two levels. One is the intra-country migration and the other is the inter-country migration. And they very uh, nicely summarize their work from the rural, uh, the, the migration that happens from the rural to the urban areas caused by largely the economic reasons. That is, the more productive regions uh, uh, tend to draw more people uh, while they are moving. But there are also, there is what is called as also the amenity channel in the sense that once people move to these better off regions within their own countries, they also want to move to even better off regions once they have, are better equipped in terms of their skill sets and so on and then they tend to emigrate and here uh, the weather plays a slightly different role it's weather directly has an impact on emigration whereas in the case of the rural urban migration they find that the weather agriculture and then migration is the kind of linkage that they are able to show and this is this is again a very large macro study that they have conducted in the uh, sub-saharan region um, apart from that, we also have a few ma micro studies uh, which are basically linking up looking at the household level data and particularly uh, look at uh, a panel data looks at agricultural risk and its linkage between weather variability and migration, uh, only focusing on one uh, country, that's Nigeria. And these are of course largely the um, econometric models that one is more commonly uh, familiar with. But we also have simulation techniques which are basically looking at uh, forecasting approaches where uh, in the case of the uh, Brazilian study they look at the influence of agriculture uh, caused by climate uh, change impacts and in turn how inf it influences migration. A very, very recent study about a month back, it was made, uh, it was just published, uh, which doesn't use an econometric model, which doesn't bring in agriculture directly, but sort of looks at it through the shocks and finds that there can be about th 3 to 10 million internal migrants, that is within the country people can move in the next 40 years uh, within Bangladesh. So that's the kind of uh, uh, tone that we set to this particular um, work that I'm bringing into and, uh, and understanding very well that there can be several reasons why migration can happen and being a developing country, there can be several triggers to migration. Uh, we are basically trying to focus on the weather variability induced migration operating through the channel of agricultural productivity changes. So that's the large question. And focusing on the nature of information that we have, we have this very specific objective, which is to look at interstate migration, that's at one level, states are provinces in the Indian context, they are district, uh, they, they are administrative boundaries, uh, which actually are distinguished on the basis of the languages that are spoken in different parts of the world. And at a second level, we also look at uh, districts within each of those states. That is, uh, that's where we sort of look at it at an intrastate level because there's a larger variability in the information that we have. And we also bring in a certain difference uh, in, the, in the kind of results that we have on the kind of crop choices that are made in this particular case. And I'll just tell you why it may be interesting to have uh, a crop choice very shortly. Uh, 
So how does a migrant get defined? A migrant, uh, as far as the data set that we are using, is based on the national census, uh, the country level census that is conducted every 10 years. And, uh, and in that case, the question that is asked is, when they, when they go to a particular household, the question is, is the place of enumeration different from the place of last residence? And if the answer is yes, then you are a migrant. But then there is also an, another interesting angle to that in terms of how long and what is the duration you've stayed in. And that question is also added along with that. So even if you have been staying in a place for 30 years, sometimes you can be called as a migrant for the simple reason that you were born somewhere else and so on. So there is a little bit of issues in terms of how the migrant is exact, exactly defined and uh, some of it is discussed in a little bit more detail in the paper. And the migrants are then further classified into these four or five categories, some of which we will be using for our analysis. Uh, durations of stay, this is what I was just mentioning, how long a person has been in a different place of enumeration. Uh, the gender issues are important in the Indian context. Then you have the source and the destination, whether you move from rural to urban or rural to rural, within the state, between the states and so on. And then there is also a very interesting category in the Indian context that when uh, because of the practice of what is called as exogamy and endogamy, that is people marry within families and people marry within their own villages, as well as there are cert several parts of the country where people uh, marry outside their village and so on. So the question of have you migrated also uh, uh, very strongly affects the reason for migration. So you will find that the a large number of women call themselves as migrants, though they are actually for ma migrating for social reasons. So there are several reasons and some of which is, is not directly relevant to our study and we'll be using that for our analysis. Now this is where I, I just said that there's been some amount of interesting patterns that are emerging. If you see the dark line out there, that's the All India migration rates that you see there across the four census years that we have used at the uh, data for our analysis. And you see that the migration rates for men uh, is just about a little up around 10 percent, but it's kind of declined. Whereas for the women, the migration rates are higher at about 16 percent. And the difference is largely because of the reason for migration that women tend to give, which is not only for employment and other reasons, but also for marriage. But what you also see is that there has been a decline more in the case of male migrants than in the case of female migrants. You expect that less to happen here, but the fact that it has still happened is, is also a puzzle and, and there's not much uh, work going on there. But what has really uh, bothered the uh, people who are working on the migration literature is that why is it that when the uh, pace of urbanization has been somewhat good, when the economic growth has been fairly high, the migration rates have actually declined over the years and that, that people are not moving as much as they should for the level of development that we are having here. So that's a kind of debate that's still going on and figuring out and we are still, uh, our latest 2011 census has, data has been collected but it's not yet collated and put out for information. And here when we start splitting it up into uh, the source and the destination, the first R or the first letter R or U stands for the source and the uh, second letter U would then st or R would stand for the destination. So the, the, the possible ways for us to uh, classify the data set is to look at rural to rural, urban to rural and so on combinations. We would largely be focusing on rural to rural and urban to rural uh, analysis in this particular case uh, for our, our work. And, and what you see is that uh, there is also another pattern overlaid on top of that, whether they move within the district boundaries, which is a sub level of the administrative boundaries within the states, where they move between districts. So these two are within the provinces or within the states. And this is the third category that you see is between states. So the reason for looking at between states is because there's a lot of difference in the levels of development across the states. And, and you do see that there is a quite a bit of variation in the economic growth rates as well as the rates of industrialization and so on. So uh, that kind of pans out in the result that we're seeing for the men is that the rural to rural migration bar that you see, which is the first bar, is actually declining in numbers. So though the migration rates have been declining, the numbers of rural to rural migration is actually declining and that to some extent is responsible for the decline in migration rates. But what I would like you to observe is that the rural to urban migration is actually picking up and by 2001 it's been quite substantial. What is also substantial to note is that this 
colored brick layered uh, mark that you see there which discusses about the interstate movement is also actually picked up in the case of men. So two things have changed for men. One is that more and more of men are moving from rural to urban areas and that that's mostly interstate movement. Uh, while in the case of women, you can see that it's predominantly rural to rural. That is what is increasing, whereas all the other categories of migrants are very small in number. So what we see is that uh, if you really again go back by the reason of migration, you'll see that marriage still dominates as about something like 90% of the women would report marriage as the only reason for migration. So, uh, so, the, so that's how it's also important for us to choose what uh, form of migrant we are trying to look at. And while we also try to look into the case of uh, 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 another data set, which is not coming from the census, but called as a National Sample Survey Organization or NSSO, which uh, recently was able to collect data on what is called as long-term migrants and short-term migrants. And here you can again see a very clear difference of what we call as the monthly per capita consumer expenditure deciles. So this is the poorest and this is the richest decile here. And you can see that anyway women dominate when you try to look at them in a long term sense. But what we also see is that this one is the urban male. So the people who have migrated among men to the urban areas are largely from the richer sections. That means the most skilled have been able to make use of the transitions that have taken place during this period. And when you look at short term migrants, this is predominantly male migrant and they are mostly from the poorer sections. So there is also a, an issue of how the migrants are or what kind of backgrounds they come from and how, what kind of uh, uh, migration that they undertake. A short term migrant is one who stays away from his uh, place of residence for less than six months, whereas the long term migrant is one who has moved away from his place of residence uh, for, for any, any time beyond one year. That's how they try to classify these two groups. of. So having set the tone for this data that we are trying to look at, and we know that there's quite a bit of uh, <coughs> issues in terms of understanding what could be the reason finding out whether induced migration migration could be somewhat difficult for the information base that we have and we are looking at it through through to, through both these channels that was discussed in the literature that's the agriculture channel and the amenity channel um, and so what is the data set that we have uh, as i said we have two kinds of data, two uh, levels of uh, analysis carried out the first one is the state level <coughs> And that looks at interstate out migration rate. That is, somebody moves from one uh, place, one state to the other state. We have three years of data. But within those three years of data, we have what is called as durations of stay. So between any two census year, we have somebody who said, I have been here for the last one to four years, and I've been here for the last five to nine years. And using that, we sort of classify our information on the past. So somebody who says in 1981 that he came five to nine years before to the place where he gets enumerated, then the person must have come between 1972 to 1976, then we have similarly somebody who says one to four years, then the person would have come between 1977 to 1981. So we are able to splice the information that is given in the census to further uh, get more data sets over time. So we are able to create about six time points uh, which cover these five years. I do not know individual years, so I have to work with these uh, periods that we are looking at, but we are able to work with 15 large states in the Indian context and we exclude people who say marriage as a reason for migration as well as people who say place of birth as a reason for migration because that's another social issue when the mother while delivering her child uh, tends to go back to her natal home and the child gets registered in the natal home rather than where the child is staying. So we had to exclude these two cases of uh, uh, migration as a reason for migration. Um, when we come to the state level, the challenge is slightly different in the sense that uh, we do not know the source of migration. We do not know where the people came from, but we know where the people are getting into. So, uh, and, and we also are able to work with only one census. Uh, the advantage of this is that we have a panel data with about 90 points, that is six years, 15 states, whereas here we have Two sen one census with two years of duration, but a whole lot of districts, about 500 at odd districts that we have in the country. So you can see that the variability in the data set is likely to be different between these two contexts. And 
because of the district level, we don't have reason for migration given. We have done one estimation for total migration rates and one for male migration rates. So that sort of very quickly uh, tells you the way we, we have to organize our data set. The temperature and rainfall was also not an easy data set to work with, but luckily the uh, Indian Meteorological Department gave us very uh, detailed data sets, made it available to us, and one of our um, co-authors, I mean one of the co-authors in another work was actually working on this data set and we're happy to have the data set that he provided to us and we sort of updated that to correspond to our uh, years. The agriculture data set has been taken in, in also at two levels in the sense that one we look at the net state domestic product for agriculture which is per capita and we, which is the value added from agriculture and then we look at two crops separately that is rice and wheat which are the predominant crops that we have in the uh, Indian context um, that people tend to grow. The econometric methodology, as I said, follows a very uh, simple simultaneous equations model approach. So the first, the main equation of focus is migration influenced by yield. And there is no other explanatory variable or any other variable directly in the model. And all of the remaining variables are assumed to be either in the fixed FX across cross section or the fixed FX across time. So we basically do a test and find out that that's the kind of model that fits in. And then uh, we test for whether the yield is endogenous, meaning it's correlated with the error term. In which case, the yield equation is to be explained by the temperature variables that are sitting here. So we have this kind of relationship in the, in the, in the framework that we have here. So that's the, the large model that we have there. If you look at the state level, uh, the interstate out migration rate and use the value added from agriculture, we actually do not find any evidence for endogeneity, which essentially means that we cannot estimate it as a two equation framework. The weather is largely insignificant in the migration equation and but the yield has an impact on the migration it's a very small amount very small rate that we are looking at in the in the particular case if we shift to particular crops that is the wheat and the rice uh, you will see that there is a fairly strong uh, relationship of endogeneity com compared to what we had earlier, more stronger in the case of rice than in the case of wheat, which means we can use a two equation model that we are referring to. But while we are doing that, the weather in the rice equation is actually insignificant and, and uh, but overall we find that the yield has an impact on the migration. Two very quick observations is that the magnitude of this case uh, in the case of wheat is lower than in the case of rice in the sense that because rice is more cultivated in larger regions, rice is also more labor intensive. So we expect that coefficient to be larger, but you can see that the significance level is, is also not that high as one would have expected it to. Um, now we uh, move on to the district level and in the case of the district level, I would uh, very quickly expect you to understand uh, one thing which is different from the earlier case. So what are we trying to say that if the yield declines, uh, then the, the migration rate would go up. So therefore, that's what it basically means or other, in other words, the, if the yield increases, then the migration rate would decline. So there is an inverse relationship between yield and migration. You can also see that the kind of variables that affect wheat and rice, the temperature variables are also so different and that's important from the perspective of policy which I'll come to towards the end. When you move to in migration data, now we have to slightly look at the results differently that when somebody comes into a particular region, they would only come in when the agriculture is doing well. So in the case of uh, the in migration, we would actually expect a reverse sign. That is a sign that when yield goes up, more and more people would come into a particular district and we would expect a positive correlation between the two. So therefore, there is, there is, a, there is a, that linkage that would change when I'm working with in migration data. But what is also important to note is that there is, there is a mix of what is called as intra-district movements and inter-district movements which kind of affect our results. So if you look at the wheat case, uh, there, is, there is endogeneity in both whether we look at total migrants or whether we look at male migrants. There is a positive sign which sort of goes with what we look at. That is if a district does well in the uh, uh, yield, it draws in more migrants and uh, people tend to move more within that particular region. And you can also see that there is the, the weather variables are kind of mixed. What you see here is that this is the impact of the sowing temperature 
This is the impact of the harvesting temperature. So you can see that if the sowing temperature goes up, then you have a different impact. The harvesting temperature goes up, then the yield declines. So that's the kind of results that you see here and you can also see that it's the the percentage of male migrants is always higher than the percentage of total migrants the emphasis is that the wheat rice results are completely in contrast to what we see there the first contrast is basically in terms of seeing that the endogeneity is much stronger in the case of rice we see that the coefficients are also far more significant but they are negative in the sense that if a district does well in its yield uh, in its yield of agricultural uh, rice yield or it has a much higher productivity in rice yield then it the mobility tends to decline that's the kind of results that we are finding which is in contrast to the case of the wheat uh, case but what we also find is that compared to the state level results the district level results also show a much better linkage to the uh, temperature impacts so just by summarizing this we would basically say that there is uh, there is a, there is some evidence of the kind of uh, changes that you see on on the migration and and the patterns are also dependent on how we are trying to look at the linkage if we just do a simple hind casting exercise rather than a forecasting exercise we find that there's a moderate change in the the migration rates that would have declined had there been uh, a 1 degree centigrade temperature lesser increase in the last 30 years of that we are looking at. So in another sense if the annual temperature were 1 degree more than what it has been in the last 30 years we would have seen about 0.44 percent increase in the migration rates than what we are seeing here and as you can see we had to choose the particular temperature and so on because the models were a little more complicated so just to summarize we do have a weak evidence if one were to look at it but it's largely depending on how the uh, agriculture is showing up as endogenous we also see a very small migration rates but yet we find that there is some amount of linkage between uh, the migration rates affecting uh, affected by the changes in crop yields due to the climate change. So we see that there is, we have sort of set the tone and this is for the first time in the Indian context, we've been able to organize this information base to this extent to be able to pull out the kind of uh, information that we are trying to get. And there's quite a bit of work that we, are, that we need to do to take it forward particularly in the context of what it means for a very high proportion of rural to rural migration. Thank you so much.